This is Thorin, and I just want to let you know that even though the first answer you're going to see here was actually from part one, it was the StarCraft section, because this is the League of Legends part, and I know some people who only care about League are only going to watch this part, I included this question and answer that Wolf already gave, because I think it's actually an important message for League of Legends fans to know about the reverence he has for the game. By the way, one thing I'll ask you, because we may as well get it out of the way at the beginning, is later on, obviously, when we talk about some of the league stuff, obviously, that was probably the most hostile crowd you came into. But I think that part of the reason why is because you're trying to play the role. This is what's also different about your career. You're not just trying to cast each game. Like, I know loads of people, by the way, have done loads of games, but they're like a host or, you know, they're fucking the interviewer on stage. So it's like, the, the information burden's obviously not the same. But obviously, one of the things people might complain about with you, Wolf, but the joke is, I think, like Monty, I assume it's something you're proud of. And it's not like a fucking feature, not a bug, is you're an elitist, right? I mean, the joke is you moved to fucking South Korea to cast video games. Like, you got to be pretty into it. You don't just go there like, hey, everyone's good. And you know, who cares who wins? Like, you kind of like, you like excellent play, right? Yeah. And you have to be, I think you have to be harsh when it's necessary as well with, with, um, with casting. And I, I think a lot of people don't do that. Like, for example, the Korean commentators generally don't ever do that um, yeah. because it's, it's seen as it, in Korean culture. It's seen as kind of like taunting a player if you go, "Oh, well, I really don't think he's in. You know, his form is really not good." Like you could say that, nice. but you could say like, "Oh, this this is a really rough game. Like this is one of the worst games I've ever seen of this player." You know, like they would never say something like that. Whereas I I would, you know, if I, I thought a player was having the worst game I've ever seen of them, or at least in recent memory, I would say something like that because I think those words have power, and if they have merit, I think it's smart to say them because. It lets a viewer know, especially one who's not that familiar necessarily with the player's recent history, that, man, this is uncharacteristic, but he is having a bad game or his his form this season is really, you know, it's quite atrocious. So people need to know what the the kind of real um, sentiment around this player is right now. I mean, if you go open, you know, Twitch chat or, or Reddit or whatever or Twitter, you're, you're going to know the real sentiment around the player, right? But I think as a commentator, you also kind of have to say that um, as well. And... Coming into league, I I was coming into a game that had a decade of esports history in Korea, and I had watched it quite significantly. You know, I watched it pretty casually through a lot of the years. A lot more recently, I got more and more into it um, towards towards right before I ended up commentating it. Also because I knew it was a potential opportunity for me. But League of Legends, um, the fan base was so. I want to say welcoming in the beginning, but then very, very harsh towards me. But I, I never really took it personally because if you have expectations of commentators who come into a league who have to, been doing League of Legends their whole lives, their whole careers, which is most League of Legends commentators, and then you have this other guy who's bounced from game to game to game and then showed up in yours, and you don't like his casting style especially. Like if, if you don't like my casting style, you're, you know, you're to dislike me anyways right i mean and people did dislike me in every game i did because they didn't like my casting style but i wouldn't say that majority did but some people did right but if you don't like my casting style and you don't trust me yet because you know i'm making some mistakes or my knowledge of these players even though i've been you know doing a ton of research for example it still has some holes in it or i, I missed some some um i don't know reference to an old meta that that one of my co-casters may have made a lot of people were really frustrated with that because they're like, this is what I love and this is what I've been watching forever. And I, I totally empathize with those people because if it were me watching, you know, somebody like me in a game I was really interested in, I might be a little bit upset. I probably wouldn't go type it out on the internet. I wouldn't be that upset. But I hope that people know that. I mean, I've obviously made massive improvements in, in League of Legends in the, over the last three years, but I hope people know that this is not just a gig for me. Like, I really care about it a lot and I really right. enjoy it. And League, League is a game to me that feels like Brood War, when I play it in terms of its complexity, in terms of how hard it is, in terms of how, like, if you click a certain way, your character's going to move in and path in a weird way because you're too close to the wall and actually you thought you were going to dodge that cue, but then you, you got hit by it and you died. Like, these small things mean so much. You know, you can flash a ton of walls in League of Legends, but you have to do it just right or you'll fail flash the wall and die. Like, how Cutthroat League is, um, I really, really enjoy. And the the rich history it has that even though I've I've studied so much of it and watched so much of it, frankly, especially the beginning, um, and then in the middle, I you know I've I've reviewed a lot of that stuff, and I really enjoy going back and watching the OGN days, even some of the the finals I didn't catch live. Um, it has such a rich rich history that I love delving through, and it's it's been one of the most exciting challenges I've ever done um, in my career. When I when I got the phone call, when I got the offer to do it, 
I was simultaneously both extremely excited, but also that I had this feeling of like, I am going to have to hit the books, you know, and go really hard into this. Like, this is not something I can wing. This is not something that I can can show up to. I don't wing anything in my life, but like, I I basically told them like, I don't know if I can be ready in time, and they're like, well. We trust we trust your ability and like it will come to you naturally eventually and and we kind of agreed like this would be a good fit for me talking to the commentators talking to the production staff at at Riot Korea and ultimately I signed on but it has been um, I don't want to say it's been a battle but it has been sometimes taxing when I get a lot of you know angry comments on the internet but I, I always understand that the feelings that people have about me you know in the in my early times of casting league, sitting next to people like Atlas, who's the most the person who's commentated the most in Korea, um, they make sense, and I hope that as as it, you know, I have grown a lot massively, but I'm not anywhere near where I want to be yet. But I hope that in the years to come, that people will know that I've been doing this for half a decade. In two years, I will have done this for half a decade, and like I will have that that tenure in that in that respect. And um, it matters to me a lot that the quality of the broadcast is as high as possible. So I'm working insanely hard. And I, I do feel happy to address this type of discussion, though a lot I've talked about it a few times on talk shows, I've talked about in interviews, but um, the most important thing to me besides the players <laughs> is the fans that that watch the show. You know, like I love watching the players. They're, they have my utmost respect in esports more than anyone else, more than production, more than anything else, because their um, determination, their dedication to the craft is is so insanely high, especially in Korea. But the fans are, are number two to me in terms of um, their enjoyment. I, ho I hope they can get it from me. And I will be brutally honest about players. And I will be sometimes, um, I have been sometimes off on some of my assessments early in the early days. But uh, I love casting this game. And it means everything to me. So I just want people to know that. Being as, obviously, one of the weird things about your career too is because even though, as people will know from some of the stories, some of the commentators, like I said, of just being in the Korean scene get to do multiple games, but you're the one that's done the most. And as a result, like, your, like the Venn diagram of casters is just you in the center. It's like everyone in like Counter-Strike, Starcraft, and then you eventually they've all worked tangentially with you. So one of the people who obviously, until Overwatch, you didn't really get a chance to work, it was Monty. Even though, like, Testos is in the Korean scene the whole time you're there, like, it was really until this game and then I mean he's not really doing league now but sort of you do a bit of league with him now right who was Monte Cristo to you because obviously I know I was there when I was in Korea like you knew this guy the whole time he was another person you were friendly with etc who is Monty to Wolf I mean Monty to me is somebody who was the first um commentator in Korea that had the style that I that I wanted to to be like I think in a lot of ways I wouldn't say like he was a role model for me necessarily but you know when I was talking earlier about Tastos had the humor style, and I was trying to do a little bit more player history, a little bit more storytelling, a little bit more like serious focus on on players' abilities and what they're strong at. He was doing that um, in a fun way, but also a serious way. Um, but he also had good humor. That was what I was very jealous of. He and Doe were very funny. I, I never really was. Um, but I really enjoyed his casting. And you know, when he first moved to Korea, he reached out to me. He was, you know, like, "Hey, let's meet. I'd like to meet you." And I said, "Sure." And we we had a few drinks together, and I became friends with him very quickly. Spent a lot of time with him. He's always been a a strong mentor to me, um, giving me good advice on my career, things he thinks I uh, did well, things he thinks I I definitely shouldn't be doing. Um, and sometimes I had to like pull it out of him because I think Monty is, at least to me, a type of person who won't tell you like hey i think you're screwing this up unless you go to him and say hey like i'm, oh, you I'm have worried to explicitly about explicitly ask for the made. advice like, or something right yeah yeah I, I'm, I, I'm i'm worried about this decision i made like is this as bad as i think it is for example or or you know what what do you think my weakness is at, at this particular moment like he will he will tell you about that um but i've always really enjoyed working with him and i worked closely with him when he was starting to cast overwatch obviously and um and I think he was a, one of the big reasons why I was even invited to the Overwatch League in the first place because he vouched for me super hard and, and thought that Achilles and I would be a good fit to, to come in based on what we'd done in uh, at OGN at the time up until that point. So um, Monty is the type of person I think of who, especially in when casting techniques haven't been figured out or mastered for a game, he's always been so good at essentially saying this is the way it should be done. And, and people often, I think, emulate how Monty casts because he sees 
timings in League, for example, that nobody else is seeing. Like, he was looking at how lane swap metas were being played in a different way than other commentators at the time were, were doing. I think people watched Monty and they were like, oh, he's got a really good point. I want to study this aspect of the game more. And for me in Overwatch, especially, that was kind of how I looked at Monty's first two seasons of uh, Apex was, I mean, he really has a good grasp on what the points in this game that are important are and how to explain them in a succinct way and make it seem interesting also at the same time. Um, so I, I really feel like I emulated a lot of, of his casting style and some of Papa Smithy's casting style from Overwatch as well. But uh, yeah, Monty is, is a close friend and always been an ally of mine and, and other things we've tried to work on together and, and things we've tried to push when we think companies are doing something a little bit unjust or something that um, could be improved on. Like he's always willing to, to go and, and push the envelope a little bit when other commentators are, might be a little bit afraid. And I've always really liked that about Monty. Right. One thing I wanted to ask about League, we sort of touched on it earlier, but I've got a, a more explicit way of asking, which is when you come to the game League of Legends, even though the joke is compared to a game like StarCraft 2, I would actually consider it a much less hardcore esports game. I'll tell you what, the fans didn't get that memo, Wolf, because not just the Korean fans, but League fans in general are nutters. Like, they're all just super hardcore and they're all just, they all just lived in this one game. Most of them didn't come from other esports games. So one of the problems I actually feel like you have when you come in for your position, you're trying to do like the color expert role, as it were is dude i think like you get it either way if you don't know some specific detail about the game itself which obviously is insanely information burden dense like it has hundreds of champions interactions items you have to know each season and meta like you can't even just look at a wiki without knowing some of the context right not only does it have that part in the game but then also if you don't know the whole esports history they'll flame you too like if you ever make a mistake about who someone used to play with or what team they were on or when they they're going to think you know what they're going to do is they're going to do that thing where you get one thing wrong and the famous refrain from the fan goes is you know nothing about this game it's not that you just got it wrong you know nothing you're a total fraud so as i can see why when you came in there's an intimidation factor to come in the league actually like it's huge but in a way where like you can fail in a really huge way or it can go against you right when you come into the yeah. game did you have any way of like offsetting this was there some like like did you try to start a little bit more humble or did you try to be careful about what to say initially what was that sense because i've heard when people become commentators in general that sometimes advice is like you know like hold off on the strong opinions till you're established as it were what did you do because i feel like to me I felt like pretty quickly you were just wolf you're just doing your shit right? I mean so uh, at the very beginning especially the first like maybe three or four months when I I knew more than I was confident to say right um, a lot of my colleagues and, and league people were would message me like hey I enjoyed to see you came, came to league I think you're doing a fine job for your you know for your early days and I, and uh, massive props to you knowing what you don't know like a lot of people would say like oh, it seems okay. like you really know what you don't know right. well that's not what the fans said uh, about me, but you know, I think a lot of my colleagues were like, "Oh, you've you mask that you're a new caster in this scene very well." Um, but you know, I I learned very quickly as you see the fans in League of Legends are a little bit more rough around the edges, especially compared to Overwatch. Overwatch fans are everything is happiness and rainbows, and if a player has a bad game, like the top Reddit comment on an Overwatch thread might be like. Oh uh, well, this is you know he's having you a, know, a supposed to flame. Yeah, exactly. The game, but yes. yeah, yeah, but he's 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 gonna bounce back. Like, yes, I love Jake. He's great. You know, like use now is our 18th place, but like <laughs> let's let's, let's keep supporting him. Yeah. Whereas in league, like you know, somebody fails one flash over the wall, and the top Reddit comment is like, he's gonna remember that terrible flash for three years, sure. you know, or whatever. Like, uh, it's like just um, the kind of the kind of like super hyper negativity that you'll find. Like, it people very. I find. One of the sad things, I'm not saying everybody does this, but the, the more prominent communities will, I feel like, celebrate greatness less than they will um, shit talk a mistake, right? And that always finds, I always find that to be kind of frustrating. And why for a while also I kind of stayed off of social media um, around League pretty pretty aggressively. Like I, I actively for a while just didn't read any post-game threads or I tried to stay off Twitter. Um not just for people uh, coming at me, but also for people coming at players. I just really, it just made me feel uncomfortable. It made me feel really, um, like, like I was, I was drowning in a sea of, of people who just only wanted to hate. And, uh, and I know that's not true, but they're the, the, the um, vocal minority on online that sure. you see. And that's not even everybody who's online. Like, no, no. don't get me wrong, but it seems like it's the most upvoted thing is some, some sort of, leering insult or, or 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 like a jab at a player or he only did this damage damage on this champion in this meta you know and it's just like 
it was it was a bit uh, wearing on me for a while. So I kind of did like that was one of the things I did do early on in league is try to stay off of social media. Um, and I think in some ways that made people think I didn't care that they were unhappy right. with some of the stuff I was doing. So then I I took a different approach later on and tried to interact with people on on Reddit a little bit and on 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 Twitter for example and and try to be like hey like you know I appreciate the feedback like this is what I'm working on this is what this is what I thought about in this moment um, or even like an altercation I had with Cadrill for example you know I I posted about this online because I was like I just want to clear the air about this because I think a lot of people thought when I was off social media and I never responded to any of that stuff that I almost had like this holier than thou attitude. You're of a like, bit aloof. Wolf you're you're above think the lights. Right. Respond to us because he thinks he's better than us. And I don't. Um, but I just wanted to keep that out of my headspace for right. a while. I'm much more comfortable with, with social media now, but that is one of the, the things I did try to tiptoe around a little bit when I was still gaining my footing in league and trying to figure out how to cast it was just trying to make sure I didn't, um, get into my own head because when you're co commenting something you start to second guess yourself because you're worried about what somebody says on the internet then you're doomed you know you can't you can't be a professional commentator if, if that's kind of the attitude you have the year that you began on the lck 2021 was obviously the year where right this is the this is where i want to ask a historical question here so the actual narrative right up until by the way game five of the fall of worlds was this is Dan one's year like Dan one was supposed to be like some people were saying like the best team ever mate like canyon and showmaker were insanely hyped and obviously like i allude to until they lost to edg in the final of worlds like everything everything was like jdg this year everything was tracking that Dan one should win everything like they essentially we were already shadow boxing them against the best teams in history like give me as the as somebody who's doing the korean league what was, was it just a dan one centric world of you were you just thinking like it's just inevitable they're gonna win i think um you know when we watched what happened at msi there were some doubts that came out a little bit but when when we watched worlds you know me and 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 the the korean caster team or the global casting team at lck we all kind of felt like okay this is coming to a head where maybe dan one is, is going to do it maybe we're going to win again and I do remember, you know, go, during MSI and during Worlds because they were so dominant in the LCK after they won Worlds and they were dominant, of course, in 2020 as well. People were starting to ma make the comparisons to the SK Telecom legacy. Yeah. Um, you know, like, are, yeah. are they crossing the line? And to me, I always felt like, well, not not yet, but we are, you know, if they, if they actually did win both of these international tournaments and then continue to win LCK in 2022, I think we would be having those conversations, but... They didn't ultimately uh, end up winning it, and I'll never forgive Khan for playing Yasuo Top in that finals. <laughs> sure. um, why did he do that? Like, maybe you want to get in their head, but <laughs> don't do that. Uh, I mean, it's not like it's a pick that's terrible, but I just don't think it was appropriate for sure. that draft. And it felt like it was Khan's way, of, and, and in the most Khan way possible, being like, I basically, it, not that it's a troll pick, but I beat you with this niche off meta pick. So if I actually played a really strong pick instead, like, what are you going to think? You're going to be like, oh, he could beat me with this. Like, what else has he got? You know, kind of mind game, I felt like that was. Um, but it, it didn't ultimately pay off, and the, they did end up losing the finals. I was so sad when they lost because I felt like they they should have lost. And I know that the narrative is always, you know, around Korea, especially with my personality. We talked about the elitism and, like, Korea's the best kind of thing that, that we've all grown up with and our, our pride for LCK. I was like, I, I feel like I'm never going to live this down for the rest of 2022, and, and no one in LSK will. And all the LPL fans are going to be like, we were better all along. Sure. Um, and it kind of was like that, but it was okay. You know, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But I remember thinking, like, oh, this is going to be my first year where I'm doing LCK where we're not the defending world champions. It would have been my second year in general, but still, I was like, oh, I wonder how the, the fan narrative will be. Will it be even more negative? Oh, LCK has actually really dropped off now. You know, all these teams are bad. Like, I, I worried that was actually how it was going to be, but it was not as bad as I expected. But that was for me that that Damwon time, the time that I I feel like everyone was most hyped about Damwon. That was like the peak, and then it became you know later on became uh, like D plus, and then the name changed, the branding changed, and now Canyon's not even on the team anymore. Um, it's a uh, I don't know how how Damwon will kind of bounce back as an org or D plus Kia will bounce back as an org now. They had a lot of really strong talent in um, in the pipeline and challengers. Lucid, the jungle player, he's, he's coming in this time. We'll see if Thanatos ends up playing for the middle of this year. They have a lot of really strong players there, so maybe their new identity will be the best challengers players coming into challenge for another title, but 
if they have a rough year, it's uh, it's tough branding wise for that team that was once at the peak, was at the the pinnacle of knocking on the door of the SK Telecom legacy, and now, you know, feels like just a bit of a sad story. I mean, they still made worlds, right? But it's it's just not like what it was before. Even though they had Deft, I know it's one of your favorites. Sure. By the way, uh, one question I have since you referenced the fans there, what they would think is. I know when Monty was casting in Korea, like I'm, I'm sure there was probably some like fan pressure that he should like support other Korean teams and SKT and stuff. But like Monty's always done like the iconoclast thing. Like he doesn't mind going against any fan group or being unpopular or whatever. Is there a perception from you that cause, even though you're a Westerner casting the LCK, cause you cast the LCK, if worlds happens, you're supposed to ride with the best Korean team. Is that, is that sort of an expectation from Korean fans? Do you think? Yeah, from Korean fans, actually more than Western fans. Um, I have definitely gotten so so many angry messages and tweets and you know even instagram dms from people when i've made a prediction for a chinese team to beat a korean team oh, for right. example right and you know when t11 worlds in 2023 just very recently um that series they played against lng was when they went back to their old style and went back to yeah, you know yeah. trying to set up lane pushes and bot lane and then uh just dominate there have roaming mids and, and that was kind of like they went back to their stuff because they were, they were doing weird drafts before that. They they couldn't really figure out exactly what their style was going to be, um, and they they struggled. And not that they like were a bad team, but it didn't look like they were the best team at the, the event by any means. And I predicted LNG to win because I was like, I just don't trust T1 is going to be strong enough right now. I thought Scout was having one of the best tournaments of his life. Um, he did not have his best uh, <laughs> best series of his life that time against Faker. Faker destroyed him. But I felt really confident that LNG was going to win. But I feel like most people voted for T1. Okay, that's that's a bit strong. I'd say a lot of people voted for T1 because they were scared of the fan backlash and they weren't oh, brave right. enough to say right. say that that they didn't think T1 was going to win. Now that night after T1 destroyed them, and I was completely wrong. Like it was an extremely sure. one sided series. I watched it live. I happened to go to Busan because I wanted to meet up with some of the casters there. I wasn't working at this point in the event. I went there. Uh, Riot got me a ticket. I was in the venue. On my way out of the venue, and for the rest of that night and the next day, there were fans from all over Korea to watch these these games, right? I would I was accosted in real life by T1 fans being like, why did you vote for LNG? I would okay. see people like, that's the guy who predicted LNG, and like yell it out. Okay. And I was like, I was like, guys, 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 like I I I, I, I legit actually thought they were gonna win. I, I like some fans like yelled it at me and they were they were getting like really intense and up in my face about it. Some fans were just really genuinely puzzled and wanted to have a conversation with me about nice. it. I had to like defend myself to them. But it was it was absolutely um bizarre to actually have this happen to me in person and not just on Twitter of like sure. because there were so many fans in Busan for this event, um just straight up like uh, accosted me. I mean, no one like attacked me or or, or like tried to, to hurt me or anything. I'm not saying that, but I did have people come to me like, "Yo, what was up with that? Why would you do that? Why would you betray us? It's it's really not cool that you would do that." Um, and uh, I was like, "No, I just I just genuinely thought LNG was gonna win. That's all." Um, and I was wrong. And it was really hilarious because I think T1 up until that point was not the team we saw them play against LNG that night, and then go on to win the World Championship. I don't think anyone really expected T1 to win the tournament up until that point. Most people thought JDG was going to win it still yes. at that point in time. But the one time T1 showed up and then they changed their entire play style, and my prediction was incorrect. <laughs> so they can, can never leave it down. But the, the people do also feel like, not just the T1 fans, but people do feel like I have a responsibility right, to predict against the Chinese teams, as if my prediction can somehow change the it's a, it almost the feels group, like right. they think the prediction is what you want to happen not what you just yeah. think will happen if you know what i mean exactly because i and i have to explain this to people a lot of the time i don't predict based on what i want to happen that would, that would make me a bad analyst i predict based on what i think is going to happen yes. um you know if a doctor says like i think you'll get better in in tomorrow i think it'll be better by tomorrow just because he hopes you're you're well that's not what you want to hear from the doctor you want to hear like Okay, like you need to put ice on that and rest for a few days, and you know sure. you want the realistic opinion. I think that's what I, that's why we exist. That's why analysts yes. exist, right? But yes, 
Oh, By the way, I, 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 if, if people don't know, here's a segue for you. So one of the famous things on LFN, the network obviously that we do our podcasts on, one of the ways I know when people, because bizarrely, people complain about the Monty Wolf show, but I can tell if they're the ones who like skim watch it and don't really like listen. Because what's weird is they always say this thing where they go, oh, they're both just enormous T1 fans. But it's like, you've never watched the episode then. Like Wolf might have seemed like he's in that category. But like the joke is Monty's the guy who gets tricked by Katie every fucking year. And then Monty definitely, vibes like Gen G when they play that boring ass style like it's actually not really Monty's if, if anything he was the old school T1 fan obviously when Fake was back in the day with like you know fucking Wolf and the other ones back in the Marin day it may be back then he was a T1 stand so the reason I bring this up is you actually have been the most loyal T1 defender the whole time pretty much since that show's been running and I, I want to ask I you this then give me your take then on this T1 five man lineup because they've now had these two years and the narrative whiplash at the end on this world is crazy Wolf because before that it was like it was supposed to be that they were the team who failed to make a dynasty because like they obviously started at the beginning of the two years as the absolute best team then you had the Genji with Chovy and Ruler came along and sort of briefly supplanted them but they could have still won Worlds they could have won MSI then this year they actually were in the regular split of the spring awesome like that was when they were doing the style they were doing at Worlds now but then obviously they got scooped by Genji in the playoffs they didn't win MSI like actually Worlds was sort of I would say narratively this is a movie they're supposed to sort of lose the semi to JDG and that's supposed to be the end of the lineup so how do you evaluate this team now because now that they've won Worlds and they're running it back again it feels like suddenly there's like actually a whole new chapter to this and maybe they can like suddenly it's like alive for them to be like the best team ever again or something so where do you where are you yeah. seeing on this team one thing because this is kind of a crazy set of narratives right I mean based on the fact that they're staying together which was something that um, you know halfway through summer you hear all sorts of reports. I mean, you hear rumors, but sometimes you hear credible rumors from like a journalist who's really well connected, or you hear something from somebody who works on a team, for example. But you know, er everyone was saying this team was, was splitting up, and right. I, and for most people who watch this team over the last few years and aren't vehemently attached to them as a fan, just like people who work in the industry, right, watching this, the most analysts are kind of feeling like, yeah, it's it's probably time. You know, it, it's probably time for this team right. to split up because there's clearly some sort of block here. Um. And then when I, I heard a few days before their announcement that they were going to stay together, in fact, and that, they, that T1 had somehow made this work with SK Telecom, you know, they, they re-signed everybody, I was shocked, even though they won, because I was like, man, what a way to just end and be like, we did do the thing that we failed to do like five times. We actually finally did it, and now we're going to split up. Like, what a great ending to this roster. But they did stay together. And my predictions for the future for this team would be that Watch cautiously, right, as the meta changes, because I think this team is sometimes struggles to figure out its identity. But when it does, when it is the team that's setting the meta trend, they're incredible at it. So I think what we saw from them this year was them riding the wave of that double marksman bot lane in spring and, and, and absolutely dominating with that. And then as the meta shift away from that, struggling, <clears throat> Faker had an injury, which is also a big, you know, asterisk we have to put on all of this because when Faker was playing injured, even though like, people really say that like, people are generally giving the narrative that it's like his mind and his shot calling. That's really the big thing, not his hand. So if he's injured, you know, how much of an impact does it make? You could see he was not, you know, playing well mechanically, yes. but also if you're in pain, are you really going to be shot calling as well as you normally would either when you're trying to focus on like your wrist hurts? Um, hard to say, but he's super integral to that roster. He's sticking around. I think the real question is, you know, for what happens for them in the future, because obviously what they accomplished at Worlds, going back to their own style, is a story in itself, and it's really cool. And I feel yeah. like it's one that wasn't really discussed about by the, by the commentators that much no, no, because it, it was so, it was so integral to like how much they won in spring to to like what they did again. But anyway, um, I think how we we quantify like what our predictions are for T1 for next year are is can they lead the meta again or not, um, and whatever they did to to kind of come together and, and put their differences aside, because it was clearly, it looked like to me, at least when I saw them on stage, even after wins where they're doing their post game interviews, I didn't want to say there was animosity with the players, but the, the atmosphere was kind of like, I'm done with this. I'm ready to move on to some, right. and do something else in my career. Right. But maybe something clicked with them in that finals. And maybe they're really excited to play together next year. And maybe they all got together and said, I know we were going to break up, but actually let's go one more year. And let's ask, you know, SK Telecom if they got the cash. And SK Telecom said, yes, let's do it. If the mindset, which we can't know, is incredibly positive within these five players as a roster, then maybe they could do it again, maybe, even if the meta is changing more rapidly um, than it did last year. Because the other thing is, 
with the new changes to the game and on patch 14 where they're, they're adding the, the void grubs and they're taking mythic items out and everything else that's happening with the, the way that the rift is looking it's a huge opportunity if you want to be the meta leader you can be and uh it's one of the craziest changes we've had to the game since they added all the new items and changed the item icons and stuff it's one of the biggest changes going into a new season maybe t1 can be the meta leaders if they can't be i'm not saying they're going to be a not a playoff team but will they have the the power to beat you know some of these other super teams like Gen G this this season. It's hard to say, but my my look back on T1 is they overcame a lot this this uh, this last year in 2023. They overcame the curse of not being able to win the finals. They um, overcame Faker's injury and were able to recover and then go to that go on to the to that finals. They recovered from essentially uh, a legacy of a roster that had always failed when it mattered most and. Um, that's kind of how I'll remember this team is for 2023 is starting off dominant, going through hardship again, but then ending on the highest note possible and getting that fourth star. Right. When it comes to fan bases, Wolf, because I've been in all these different esports games, it's like the joke is I keep thinking I've seen the level of how wild it can get, but I never have. It keeps expanding. Because, like, if I think of some fan bases, like you have national fan bases in Counter Strike, for example, people know the TSM fans in League could be annoying at times. Then you have, like, for example, if you know Brazilians in any esports game, they go mad for their players and they'll spam everything on the internet. But, mate, I have never experienced anything like T1 fans. They are on a different level. Because I'll give you an example, right? Not only do people know the stories that in real life, when T1, this lineup, which they eventually did win Worlds, wasn't winning, they would actually, for real, hire trucks to come that had messages on them as like almost like, almost as sort of like an intimidation to the players that you better get your shit together. Like, look, we're going to actually like physically show you we're disappointed with you. Almost reminds me of like football ultras or something. And then the other angle is, even personally, like when I said all that stuff about like, I thought T1 shouldn't have won Worlds and Faker wasn't the best player. Dude, they didn't just like get mad at that they would actually spam like all my content for like three weeks as in they you'd see a comment like from a korean name on youtube on like a counter-strike video and the comment would be like as long as he doesn't talk about t1 i guess this guy's okay and you're like what like you're not even a counter-strike fan so like they're on another level mate they're so dedicated so i want you i thought since they're like the probably like the most extreme version give me a sense for someone who's a westerner and has only ever followed esports like casually online what are korean fans like what are these like fan bases and these like hardcore fans what are, what are they like and why are they like this? Give us. Some, uh, by the way, I, I have carefully, unlike I would on somebody insight, phrased that fairly open ended and semi polite because I don't want to like encourage people to hate on you because <laughs> you obviously work there. But give me some sense of like why this so intense. So, so um, I think that there's just a really deep love for these players and the teams, and there's an attachment there where the where the fans feel like they're part of the. They're they're part of the family, um, you know. It's it's like that that meme where it's like bro thinks he's on the team, like um, oh right, like, sure. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. But um, it's like when a, a American sports fans often say we need a new running back, as if like they're like even right. on the coaching staff, like you know sure. when they when they talk about yeah. we need to get this, we need to do that, like you know, it's kind of like that sort of mentality of like I'm I'm so attached to this that like it's part of my identity, and I think sometimes that can be almost unhealthy, but. They just don't want anyone to to speak ill of the thing that they consider a part of themselves. Like they take it almost like a personal insult. Yeah. Um. Not that. Not the to think that like I'm insulting that person or that I'm insulting fans. But I think they, if I said I don't think T1 is going to beat LNG and that person really thinks they do, it almost feels like in their mind they think I'm saying that they're dumb because they think it could happen. Right. You know. Like. Um. So I I think there's a lot of that. I've had. All sorts of altercations with with fan bases of many different Korean teams. Um, I got embroiled in a controversy once because um, I talked about how Korea had a perfect record. I think this was in it was in twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two. I don't remember which world it was, but anyway, Hanwha, I guess it was twenty twenty one. I think Hanwha Life had had the only loss of any Korean team, but they lost to a Korean team. So it was like, well, one Korean team is going to lose no matter what. So I basically said Korea has a perfect record except Hanwha. And then I put like the one, and for this, I put one K, like, you know, which is the Korean, like, K-K-K, you know, you've seen this, this symbol. It's Everybody a laugh right? right? Yeah. And in Korean culture, if you put one K like that, it's kind of like a, you know, kind of like, it's, it's a, like a little okay. bit aggressive. It's a little bit like almost seems like um I was taunting. 
Han was, but tr- okay. truthfully, I would have. I actually had two in the original tweet, but I deleted one because I ran out of characters. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'll shorten this and like delete some periods here and delete some dashes, whatever. And the Hanwha fan base came down on me like, uh, like I had insulted, uh, you know, Chovy's Chovy's grandfather or something right. like absurd because I put one ku next to it because they were the one loss. But I was what I was really saying is like Korean teams haven't lost except. You know, to another Korean team, in which case one Korean team would lose no matter what. And I was kind of laughing, like, yes, Hanwha lost, but get because I showed every team's record, and Hanwha, oh, right. you know, had the one loss. And I and I basically was saying, like, yeah, okay, so Hanwha lost, but you guys know what I mean. And I can't, I don't have enough tweet space to say they lost to the only other Korean team. I was like, I hope you guys get that. What I mean is, they lost, but they lost to a Korean team. And I had to. Well, I felt compelled because of all the messages I was getting and all the angry uh, tweets I saw, which were getting tons of interactions. I felt compelled to apologize and explain what I meant. And I did. And people forgave me, like, eventually. But everyone was like, be careful. Don't do not do that. But it's that kind of, like, um, th- taking it personally, right, that I would be like, well, Hanna lost, though. <laughs> like, that's kind of what they thought I was saying. Like, well, Hanna was, like, way worse than the team they lost to. So, you know. I think that's kind of the way they took it. And so they thought, like, that's disrespectful. And respect is super important in Korea. That's why the Korean commentators don't go as harshly as we talked about earlier um, in reflections here, that that they they don't want to anger the fan base, but they also want to be very respectful to the players. We we have a little bit more leeway as Western commentators to actually be a little bit more critical and, and be a little bit more um, tough on the players when, when, it's, when it's required, when it makes sense. And... The fans are also just not used to that um, because Korean commentators don't do it. Uh, and then people like me or Monty or even, you know, say Valdez will tweet something like that and people might get upset. But I think it's just this devotion, which is a double-edged sword because it's that devotion, which is why, you know, the Korean scene is as big as it oh, is. Sure. It's that devotion yeah. that is yes is why, like, these players are legends and why they are popular and why they're motivated to, to do it. That and the, the bags they get because we have such a large fan base. Um, and sometimes when I, when I have this, you know, sort of thing, like the Hanwha example I just gave, I get really angry because I think, well, these fans just didn't get it. Like, you know, like, why are they, why are they kind of bagging on me for this? Like I, they, they're, they're actually just misunderstanding this. And like, even if sure. I was trying to make a slide, it's not like I, I said some crazy thing. Hanwha is the only team that lost. But then I also think like, well, I probably should have been more careful. I should probably be a little bit more, um, appreciative of the the fans attitudes and mentalities towards this thing now i will never predict based on fans i'll never do that right. <laughs> i'll never predict for t1 just because they're more popular than another team i'll never ever do that but maybe you know if i couldn't fit two because i could only do one ku in that uh <laughs> and one kyuk in that message um maybe i'd maybe i'd rephrase it next time but i love the passion and i think that the fan base is getting older in Korea too. Like a lot of the fans have been watching since like 2013, 2014 are now nine years older than they were back then, 10 years older than they were back then. So I think the fan base is maturing and uh, I'm excited to see what it's like when most of those fans who were like 15 back then or are now 25 are like in their thirties and how much they mellow out. By the way, you said that for stuff like Western social media, like Twitter, you tried like to stay off, for example, if you knew like league fans might be flaming you or too like engaged, etc. right? Obviously, you're in the unique position of being fluent in Korean that you could actually, if you chose to, go and read all the Korean sites like Forbos and DC Inside and all those forums that if people don't know, like their equivalent of Reddit, where people absolutely do shit post and say plenty of critical things. And I'll tell you what, they tear fucking people apart. Because the joke is, back in the day when I lived in Korea, I actually did do that once. I got like a thread and I a friend who was Korean, he was like a native Korean, and he was telling me what they were saying, right? And I can't, I will say it, they go harsh as fuck. Like, there was two approaches yeah, to me, for example. They would say one of two things. Either one, they'd sort of say some equivalent of like, who cares about Thorin or whatever, which to be fair is what Westerners would say. So that one's fine because he's used to that one. But believe it or not, the one that actually tilted me was they used to say like, oh, Thorin, he just says whatever Monty says, which the joke is, that outrages me because I have totally different opinions to Monty. And, and in that scenario, it's like, what the fuck? I'm definitely not just copying Monty. But my point is like, you can access this in theory. You could go and read these at any time. Do you ever do that? Do you ever wonder, like, I what do. are they thinking? I actually usually read these um, never really about myself. Like, I'm never really looking to see what people are saying about me. And and frankly, like, I, I haven't really seen people usually say things about me outside of, like, these, you know, these big things I was involved in the once or twice, right? Sure. Um, 
But usually I go on these these websites when I want to see what the Korean feeling is about. Like, for example, um, a decision that Riot made, like referees made, for oh, example. Right. Or, like, um, uh, you know, if there was, like, a big pause, right, and, you know, it was an hour-long, like, decision that 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 like there was kind of like a long time that where the decision was being made and I, i'm often surprised to see that like my my take on some of these things is like we need to wrap this up earlier this is a simple decision right um the referees definitely had a little bit more power here than they could have actually told the teams like you know basically tough shit like you need to we need to move on and like you're going to have to accept the decision or you can forfeit kind of thing and i find that the koreans would be very strict about um like the player's skill you know if they're messing up and, and stuff like that kind of you were alluding to earlier and sometimes they'll be like really angry at, at some of the decisions riot made but they're often surprisingly a lot more um open-ended at at like decisions about pauses and stuff like that like they have a debate you know where there's oh, like right. two sides okay um which i found was interesting it's, it's not always like that but I, I like to see what koreans think about those types of things and competitive integrity for example um and see if they align with my views. And also signs I, I see what people are saying, what nicknames people are giving um, to players. <laughs> there was a nickname that was unfortunately for for Poby. Uh, I never I don't think I ever talked about this on broadcast because it felt like it was too Come much. On, but me with it. Poby Poby, uh, you know, he was the faker's replacement for those who don't know. And he was a very young player who was not very strong, but he he just got thrust into this situation. Um the Korean fans were calling him uh Chovy Maker. Because whoever he played against was as it looked like they were as good as Chovy because Poby was such a weak oh, player at the right, time in the right. LCK. So they were just calling him Chovy Maker. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's stuff like that that you could find on there that's super negative. And, and, and sometimes, to be, to be fair, like really funny. But uh, yeah, it, that, those websites also are just filled with super aggressive opinions. Sometimes that you don't you don't want to read if you're a player let's just say like yes. I, if i were a player i would never i would never go to those websites they're also so difficult to scroll through a lot of the time because they don't really work like reddit where the top contest push through the top you just had to be there and see it at the moment right otherwise it just flies through yes. so fast like you might miss the meme so if, if you like didn't go if you weren't on it live and you were like i wonder what people said about this an hour ago like good luck you're never gonna find right. a funny thing somebody said <laughs> yes it's gonna be in like a match thread with 58 pages and you, you'll never find it true yeah, you'll right, never okay. find it. What about this? Then? I actually want to ask about some of the people you've commented with on the LCK. So one of them that we referenced earlier is obviously what part of the reason you got to even be on the LCK is obviously Atlas, who basically, I pointed this out to him in my interview with him, but like what people don't know about him is because he has, even what's funny is it's not that he's totally humble all the time, but he's just one of those people I can tell. He knows if he lets himself get ahead of himself, then he'll go like, he'll be too egotistical. So he always makes it sound like he's just still starting in Korea. But I told him, he basically is Monty now. He's like the modern, it's, he's got that position he's the king of the hill you know so one of the things i complimented him on because i already saw this with ls when he worked with him back at the beginning of ls being a commentator was i think atlas is really good actually at pairing with people who have strong opinions because he's sort of he's he's got like such a he's such an amiable character to me he's so he like humanizes the cast for me like the difference is one of the reasons why i think some people might not like somebody insight for example is like there's no like there's no like reasonable person there. It's me and Monty. We just sort of hype each other up to go even more extreme, right? I, I noticed when Atlas paired with you, I felt like actually he helped sort of like get you across to the the audience a bit more and, and helped gradually establish you as an expert. What would you say? Yeah, I, I think so. I think Atlas did a really good job of of kind of reining me in, and also when you know some early errors were made, trying to to kind of like pull pull like me back to reality a little bit, and um, he was really good at um teaching me about some of the memes that I didn't know about, for example, and some, because the LCK has like its own old, old like dictionary of, of memes and stuff like that. Yes. Even though I've watched so much LCK, like I, some of these references went over my head, um, like calling a Callista a Pokemon trainer because, you know, she's got the, her fate's call like pulls the oh, Pokemon right, back. Sure. And so it's returning sure, with a Pokeball right. kind of thing. That's good. By the um, way, a shout out in general to the like Korean and Chinese scenes because they're so much better at these memes, dude. Like they're actually, pretty, they're actually sick nicknames and memes out there. They're always cool. Like, it's always a funny angle to it. So there's so many memes like that, like nicknames for the Rift Herald um, and stuff like that, that I, I knew some of them, right? But I like... I wanted to really know them and know their history and stuff. So he was a really good right. uh, teacher at explaining um, all those memes. And I was also on the other side, like 
I told him when I was watching, you know, and studying a lot of the LCK over the, the previous year that it happened, 2020, to, to study and prepare for that, that audition type thing I did, I, I mentioned earlier. I was like, you guys use so much jargon in the LCK. Like, so many of these weird terms. There's an actual on, like, Leaguepedia, there's a dictionary of, like, so all these jokes that, like, okay. <laughs> it's, like, ages of stuff that they use on the broadcast. And I was like, look, I'm a new person here. I know all the memes now, or most of them. But when I was studying this, I realized, like, when you guys were talking about some of this stuff, I had no idea what you were referencing because you because I wasn't watching every single day. You know, I was combing through a lot of odds and catching the big games and stuff like that. I was like, I think we should use less of this. And like, you know, we we went back and forth on a little bit. Like Atlas was like, no, I think this is really important to our brand, and I think we've kind of come to a little bit of a middle ground there. But um, he was really good at welcoming me in, getting me to like meme with the casters, you know, make my own memes and 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 kind of you know inside jokes that we have on the show and making me feel like I was part of the family. And, uh, you know, he and I have always been great friends. Like, we worked together since Overwatch, and we had the beautiful tracking moment um, with Atlas back in Overwatch, which was really fun. Um, I know you guys talked about that on his episode a little bit as well. But uh, he he and I have been very close friends since he moved out here, even though after he stopped doing Overwatch, we weren't casting together, you know, at all until I moved into LCK. Um we always were friends. We always hung out together. We always talked about life and, and even non-casting stuff. Like he's been one of my best friends um, since I moved, since he moved here. So um, working with him has been great. Uh, I think he is very optimistic as a person. I'm oftentimes a pessimist. So I think it's really healthy for both of us sometimes to, sure. to see the other side. Like when I'm being overly negative about a situation, not, not even in casting, just in life. Um, he can often put a really nice positive spin on it for me and be like, well, actually, like, I think you're being too negative about this because look at the reality of the situation. Here's the positives. And I think sometimes I maybe less successfully um, can tell him like, you know, when he is over optimistic, about like, Hey, like, actually this seems pretty bad. Like, maybe we need to work on this uh, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think that, that like kind of yin and yang thing that we have, as you mentioned about like, um, you know, him being super positive and empowering somebody like me on the broadcast works really well for us uh, as a you know when we do cast together as a, as a duo so now that i've gotten like my league like um jitters out now that i've got a lot more experience now that i i'm actually a three-year going into fourth year which is crazy to me uh lck commentary i hope that the two of us can continue to kind of grow that bond and ability we have together to to um the next level and i'm really excited for the future of us casting together and then an obvious name I have to ask you about is obviously Valdez, because I, I pointed this out in the Atlas episode. Somehow this guy's like the invisible man of English language Korean casting, because he's always been around all these different games, but people just forget about him. I don't know why. It's like, unless you follow just the LCK or Pro League or whatever back in the day, this is always the name people forget. But not only have you known him for ages, but people won't know this. Not only did he actually do League from the beginning, a lot of people don't know that. He was at the very beginning of League starting like 2012, but obviously he used to be your casting partner back in StarCraft 2 as well so it must be cool to actually get to work with him on a game again and also give me some thoughts over the years who has Valdez been to Wolf so Valdez is somebody who you know came out here for he won a contest with the Zubu and then got kind of interconnected with um some of the the League of Legends scene out here and ended up commentating a finals uh with like Moltrap and Double Lift I think it was the the first uh you know real League of Legends finals out here in Korea and um then I met him at WCG where, you know, as you mentioned kind of earlier on the show, sometimes you were just expected to cast random games early on in your career to, to show trust and build build that up. It was nice to WCG and be like, okay, you're going to cast um, Warcraft 3 and Street Fighter. You've never cast them, but, like, good luck. And <laughs> okay. you'd find out, like, on the day, and, you know, you wouldn't do a great job, but now that you're watching that kind of event. So I met Valdez there. We became fast friends. Um, I met him, at, actually, weirdly enough, at the, end of a, uh, at the end of the show night. It was, like, maybe, like, 9 or 10 p.m. We're both in the elevator. I didn't know him. I was like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm Wolf. He's like, I'm Valdez. You know, I'm Brandon. Nice to meet you. And then, like, he was about to get off. the. He got off the elevator. And, uh, and like, the doors were closing. I, like, pressed the open door button. I was like, do you want to come get drinks with me and Duh? Like, we, we were up here in the room. And he was like, yeah, okay. Then he got back in the elevator. And then we became friends. Like, it is, we talk about this moment all the time. Because he like, got off the elevator. Then I, like, opened the doors. And I was like, hey, uh, why don't you, like, come so hang out? So it's like the what if you never press the button again. Basically. Yeah, what if I never press the button? Yeah. I don't know. But... Who knows, right? <laughs> We probably would have hung out at some point, but anyway, uh, he came back to Korea. We hung out a lot. We became really close friends. I found out about how good he is at League. He was really good at League. And uh, I found out he was also playing StarCraft 2 a lot um, before he really got super into League. 
and um you know, Spoke TV was looking for another commentator, and they were like, please, nobody famous, also because we can't pay big rates right. and we're really broke okay. right now. Um, not that I, I mean, not that I would have stopped somebody famous from doing it if I could have, but I knew that like it wasn't going to work out. And they wanted a novice commentator that I could kind of like train and, and, and work with and bond with. So Valdez really had, besides that, that moment, you know, where he was casting the early OGN days, he didn't really have a ton of broadcast experience. He also went to WCG and just kind of cast uh, whatever game they asked him to kind of thing. But uh, I thought he had some talent. I thought he had potential. And I was like, I want to take a risk on this guy. I want to bring him into to pro league. And, um, you know, like me in league at the beginning, a lot of people were like, who is this guy? I don't know. He doesn't know anything about Starcraft. He doesn't know these players. And he was also like amplifying the fact that I was doing that storytelling about the, the new Kespa players, the new brood war players coming to Starcraft two, because he didn't know, oh, you know right. all of the Starcraft two players right. like already. He definitely didn't know the brood war players. Right. So, oh, so he was I called the to... straight man. It's like you're explaining it to him. Right. I see. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Kind of, kind of like that. So like, you know, he got to, to give me that kind of torch to, 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 he helped me push the like legacy of those brood war players forward. Um, he and I have, have been very close friends ever since back then. And, um, he didn't end up casting Overwatch, so our paths didn't cra- cross again until um, Valorant and uh, League of Legends, because we did one Valorant tournament together before we started casting lead together, and then we started casting lead together again. So um, I took like a big Valdez hiatus, and then now we're working together a lot. I love working with him because we worked together so, 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 so long. And I feel like every commentator, especially me right now, I wouldn't say especially me, but every commentator has somewhat of an ego, right? You have to, because it's a competitive industry. You have to build your brand, um, build your your presence on social media. You need to stand out. Sometimes, sometimes commentators feel like they need a mic hog because it's their moment and they want to say the thing. Um, never at any point in my in my time working with Valis have I ever felt like that with him. Right. Like, I've never felt like, oh, this guy's got an ego... He's trying to step on my toes. He's trying to block me out. He's trying to, you know, he's trying to get more popular. Now, for him, he just wants to be a good broadcaster. And, you know, if, he, if he's not going to be famous doing it, I feel like that's not that important to him. Like, obviously, anyone would like more notoriety in our industry. But for Valdez, it was never about the ego. And I think that's why you mentioned he kind of goes under the radar for a lot of people. Because he he doesn't stick out. Um, and he's not trying to self-promo himself all the time. He just wants to be a good broadcaster and do a good job and get hired to, to be that. And uh, that's how I feel about it. And I think that's why he's one of my closest friends and why I love casting with him. Right. This is another one of those questions like the T1 fan one. Well, I'll be careful how I phrase it. And I'll keep it open-ended and you just be a big boy and know how to answer it. So the question goes like this. You live within a Riot ecosystem right now. Riot are the only game in town currently, in terms of League of Legends tournaments. So, obviously, the tricky thing is, one, it's not like certain other games where you can just be, like, essentially, like, call out the TO, and then they might... Like, I've, if people don't know, the stuff I've done in the Counter-Strike side of the industry where I basically beef with the TO, but then, like, some wrestling shit come back and, like, what, what's that, Florence music? Like, that's that's such an outlier, guys. You have to understand. I even tell other people in the industry, like, don't do it like how I did it. Like, I barely made it work, mate. So, normally, you go the other route, and you try not to piss people off, right? So, the question goes like this. It's a tricky one to ask, which is, in like of what I asked about StarCraft 2 and HOTS and stuff and like obviously you want to do the big you want to do the world championship you want to do the big final you want to do the, all the players you've watched obviously your problem it's a it's a classic problem in league is when you start in those Asian regions on the English broadcast you, you, you have to climb a ladder. It's like maybe you get an invite to do a group stage game or a playing game at Worlds. And then if you if you get, you build your brand still, get, maybe like Atlas, eventually you do get to do the finals. You get to do everything. But even then it's going to be you and it's going to be two LCS people or an LEC person. What is your perspective on like, is it like a goal? Is it something you're setting to? Like, I, I want to be the guy doing the Worlds finals. Is that important to you in league? I think uh, I've done so many finals in my career and I've traveled around the world doing international events for so many different games and it is it is a, an amazing feeling when you do the finals like it is um it, it feels like a great honor right when you get selected to do it it means that you get to be the voice that 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 covers the most important thing of the year especially for like you know an international finals like world's finals right like i do lck finals twice a year um but the thing about the L- lck or rather the uh, world's ecosystem and the riot ecosystem for this is that the people who also really want to do the finals have been waiting for their chance for like five years, some of them. True, um, true. And 
I am the guy who right now does like a little bit of the group stage and then they send me home, right? And you know, I, I mentioned earlier when Blizzard didn't invite me to the to BlizzCon when I we were 15 Koreans and, and one foreigner who dropped out instantly. Um, I was really upset back then. I felt like I deserved it because of my StarCraft II experience, how long I've been casting StarCraft II and, and my wealth of knowledge of those players. Um, and League, I don't feel like I deserve to be anywhere near the finals right now just because I'm not. I'm still the new guy. And three years is a long time. But from you know, if you compare myself to to Atlas, to Vettius, to Valdez, um, to Medic, for example, to Azale, like I am a baby compared to them, and I think I need to earn it before I get anywhere close to that. I had a really, um, I, I really enjoyed the the cast that I did at Worlds this year. Um, they were way better than the international cast I'd done at any other international event um, in the league up until this point. So. You know, I, I know the fans loved our cast that I did. I did with Valdez. I also got to cast with Jat, which was really cool because he's been such a staple of uh, League of Legends casting for so long. He's not sure. even really casting that much anymore. Yeah. But he guest cast with us, which was awesome. And I really, really enjoyed it. We got to cast with Vedius a little bit, someone who's been one of the casters I've loved watching the most when I watch LEC. He's incredibly gifted. And I think he's he's really talented. I, I really like how he casts. Um, There's just so many legends in... League of Legends casting at this point who have so much experience because they've been doing it for so long that in a way I'm competing with them, but I'm kind of just for me, like whether I do the finals or not, I'd like to keep doing more. I'd like to keep moving up, but as I get ready to, as I get better, right? As I get like more deserving of it based on my tenure. And normally with casting, I don't talk about tenure ever. I like if somebody goes, well, I've been casting, you know, longer than you. I would never tell somebody like I've been casting longer than you. So I deserve more money than you or, or I deserve to do this finals more than you. That doesn't, that's not how I feel. But with these guys, I respect them and I think they are good. So I want to kind of catch up with them as best as I, as, as quickly as I can, you know, maybe ask me again in two years, if I haven't been on a final by then, or I haven't been on at least like a top four, or I'm still just doing like one part of the Swiss stage and, and going home. Maybe by that point I'll be mad and I'll be like, "Well, I deserve this." Like I'm really upset. It's a goal for sure to 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 get to that highest top level. But there's so many other people that are great at it too that deserve it too. That when Atlas got the finals with Chronicle this time, I was super stoked. Like I'm super happy for them because they did a great job all year long. Some of the times I didn't do finals in esports events, I watched the casters doing it, and I was like, "These guys don't know as much as me." They didn't work as hard as me, and I could feel jealous, right? Sure. I wasn't mad, but I could. I would feel jealous. I never really feel mad or jealous when I watch, you know, talent that I like covering these finals. And I will say that sometimes storylines are missed, right? We talk about this a lot. Sometimes storylines are missed when there's no Korean representative on the on the finals or, or on the cast at all, and, and top eight, top four, whatever. Um, I think that's sometimes overstated. But I will say, especially when you consider how much we collaborate at these events and how much we talk to each other and how much we, we share. So it's still in the heat of the moment. People don't cover all that because it's not naturally in their brain. Um, I will say Riot has made huge strides, I think, in the last few years to try to really, especially this year, try to really like put the experts forward on these broadcasts. So I'm hoping that continues because... You know, I wouldn't want to be the guy if the right was like, hey, it's your first finals. Like, I think this happened to Papa Smithy. Hey, it's your first finals. And it's like an EU versus NA finals for some <laughs> right. reason. And then I'm like, oh, like, does this even make sense? You know, but um, it's a goal. But I, I do think there is a lot of great League of Legends talent. And I'll, I'm hoping I'll get there when I deserve it. Right, one. This is. I'll, I have to start this with a rant, but you'll see where it goes pretty quickly. Right, one thing that's just a personal pet peeve of me, because that's your part of being an analyst and a person with opinions is just finding the things that really irritate you. Never shut the fuck up. Talk about them. At least that's my style. Is I really hate in any sport. Like, look, there's an obvious bias here, Wolf. I was there for the games I followed from day one, and I watched every game. Like Counter Strike, Quake, Starcraft. Like, I can actually say I really did see it all. Like, I'm not going. Like, I heard that. Um, you know, like Mad Life guy was. I saw him. I, I saw them all so it, unfortunately i'm a mega elitist in the sense that i really hate when people do lists they do this in traditional sports like nfl they'll do you know oh, top yeah. 10 players of all time but the problem is if you started watching in like 2005 just do like the top 
since 2005. Like, why bother even trying to figure out where you think a play like Joe Montana is if you didn't watch him play, you know? So you can see where I'm going with this. One thing that does irritate me is because of Faker's career, and I said this myself years ago, his accomplishments now mean he has transcended the game League of Legends. Like, he, you could argue the, the name Faker's maybe even bigger than League of Legends. Like, there's people who have never watched a game of League of Legends or played it who know who Faker is in the same way as, you know, who like Flash or Boxer or Simple. These people, they're, named, they're not just the best. They transcend the game, right? But the problem becomes when people want to do this thing of like, so who is, is Faker the greatest of all time? So suddenly you've got a guy who never watched Simple play. He heard a bit about Flash. He never see all Thresh. And it's like, what are we even doing with like, what? at the end of the day, you're just going to tell me Faker at the end anyway, because he's the only one you know. You're one of the only people who can actually do this. If someone says, who is the greatest? Flash, the Brood War Bonjour, or Faker, arguably the greatest player ever in League of Legends history. How do you even wear that up? Like, do you have an opinion on it? So for some reason, I knew you were going to ask me this. Like, I just knew this was going to come up. I knew at some point because okay. I know you and I, okay. and you know me, I knew it was going to okay. flash and faker was going to come okay. up in this interview. So I thought about, I thought about it a lot actually already. And I, I thought about it a lot and it's still really tough to answer, but what these two players do are two very different things. And it's not like you can't compare, you know, a baseball great to a basketball great. And you can't, and it's not that you can't compare like a, a League of Legends great to a StarCraft great, but I think the mistake that people often make when they talk about Flash versus Faker is they talk about the mechanics of the game. Well, technically, StarCraft was harder, so actually it's Flash. Sure. is like what StarCraft people will say. Well, technically his APM was higher, and it's actually harder what he does, and his he had wrist injuries just like Faker, but it was only him. He didn't have any teammates to, to, to hold him up by his bootstrap, so it's a 1v1 game, so it's harder. And for Faker, people will often just say, well, he has been the most dominant player ever. There was no other, like, League Bonjois, um, and there was no other person to ever be able to say he was even close to Faker throughout the entirety of League of Legends. So it's Faker. Um, that's what people will usually say about yes. Faker and League, right? Um, because he was basically popular almost throughout the entire game's history, whereas Flash was, you know, towards the latter half of Brood yes. War. To me, I think... Faker's dominance throughout all of League of Legends since he since he first stepped onto the rift, um, his ability to play with an insane amount of rosters, which again, I don't like to talk too much about whether it's the hands thing or whether which game is harder or teammates and stuff like that, but he has played with and built relationships with so many different coaches, so many different players. He has been one of the most kind and accommodating players so much so that people want to play with him so much. Like, people are, are, are flocking to him and, and his organization. They always want to play with Faker. There's a meme, you know, that everyone, when you meet Faker in an international event, you know you're going to get crushed by SKT, but maybe you'll kill Faker. Like, and that'll be an accomplishment you have, right? Sure. Um, his legacy is so huge that you can't compare him really to other, other players very much. He's been dominant this entire time. And I also feel, even the Brood War is still played um, relatively competitively today like i'd yeah, say yeah. very competitively played today with all those streamer tournaments and stuff i was talking about earlier um i still don't think it's as high as it, the level of play is probably not as high now as it was during the kespa era flash during the the you know right before he went to the military basically uh he was like playing random because he was winning everything so hard that he was like this is boring i'm playing random that's impressive in itself. That's like an anime storyline, isn't it? It's like, I've completed the game, so I have to do it on, like, hard mode. Yeah. It's ridiculous, isn't it? I don't know. So, yeah, just to define what that means for people, you know, you choose a race in StarCraft Root or Terran, Protoss, or Zerg. If you pick random, you don't know what you're going to play. Your opponent doesn't know either, so you have some, you know, advantage in that, but it's mostly a disadvantage because you, you have to know so yes. many different matchups. But you played random just because he was like, I can do this and still win. Um, that's how dominant he was, but I think... And that's and that's a plus for Flash, but it also speaks to the level of play he was dominating at the end of his career. Whereas at the end of League, I mean, League hasn't ended per se. We still have massive tournaments, but at the current place in League, as we crest 2024, Faker has just won another world title 10 years after his first one. And there are so many, there are so few players who could say they've won one. Oh, there for are sure, so few yeah. players who could say they've won two. There are... Uh, it was a pl only one player said three, and now he has done four. So, to me, the answer is Faker, and that's coming from a StarCraft, you know, background. And 
When people asked me this question in 2015, I was like, well, it's Flash. Figure hasn't accomplished that sure. much yet. But now, in 2023, I think, to me, the, the answer feels like it's definitely Faker. I think he's eclipsed Flash's his legacy. Um, and, you know, there are other Brood War players, too, like like Boxer and, and Yellow, who, you know, people were reluctant to say, like, oh, Flash is better than them now. He's accomplished more. He's achieved more. And and some people will still hold on to, like, Emil Wan because of his cultural impact he made and how he grew the game. Like, he is greater than, than Flash, even oh, though Flash's, sure, yeah. you know, achievements are stronger. Like, there are a lot of arguments you can make. I don't like to say that I'm. I, I'm. This is my opinion, and, and what I, what I'll do, which is not like the people who make these lists will do, is tell you this is how I feel. Um, a lot of people will tell you that like it's just a fact. Like, yes. It's, it's it's set in stone. I won't say that, um, and I won't do a top 20, 20 players list um, because the arrows are different. They don't, they're not. They don't line up. You know, you mentioned we mentioned earlier like Nesti, MVP, Maru. These players all play at the beginning, but. They have different strengths and weaknesses. They were from a different era. Mars dominance didn't come until later, for example. Was StarCraft easier or later then? You know, that's a conversation you can have. But I don't like lists that try to factually quantify this player is better than the other player because of, like, it was harder or the game was harder or stuff like that. I just feel like that's a weak argument. And um, maybe there's a really great argument for why Flash is better than Faker that someone could show me and I'd believe it, but it's definitely not going to be that he has more APM. <laughs> it's, that's right, sure. Be the one. Sure. By the way, one thing I did want to ask about is you obviously have this um, thing that I actually think Westerners don't know about, dude. Like, I actually think even the people who follow League, unless they follow you on social media, they won't be aware of this, which is just like Valdez, you also didn't just go to Korea. Like, I'm just going to cast a game and it's like, you know, cool. Like, for example, when I was in Korea, I never spoke a word of fucking Korean except, you know, like, thank you, bring me more of this. Like, the simple things you say in the Korean barbecue business. I was never even trying, I knew I wasn't going to live there long term, so I wasn't even trying to learn Korean. And I thought, you guys seem like you like, like committed to it when you came there. You're like lifers. Like you both did put in mad hours speaking Korean and getting fluent and learning the culture and stuff. So if people don't know, you've actually had this suit. I think it's really fucking cool. You've had these opportunities to basically partner with slash be the face of a bunch of like Korean food brands. So you did one where it was like the Buddha Jiggy, which if people don't know is like the strange stew they make of like hot dogs and stuff that the American GIs used to obviously have when they came over to Korea from the Korean War stuff. And obviously they still have the military base there. And then obviously the other one is the pizza stuff people have seen where that one's interesting in itself because I've always personally said like I don't ever eat pizza when I'm in Korea because just because uh, all I'll say is Koreans have a very different idea of what pizza is than I think sure. of what a pizza is in America or UK or something you know so how did this happen and, and what's what goes on with this because it's kind of to me that's like cultural cachet dude like you're not just like you're not just it's not the issue you've, you've fought you've been involved with like the taste of it and the actual like what the concept is right so give me some thoughts so, I mean, I, I always thought that because I could speak Korean pretty well, like I was never, you know, like in, compared to an, an average foreigner living in Korea, my Korean is, is fantastic, right? But, right. you know, if you compare it to some of the, the greats, like, you know, if we keep it to esports, Guillaume Petri, right? Like after he retired from being a StarCraft pro, he lived here for a really long time, was on television as a, as a way more famous celebrity than I than I have uh, yes. ever been out here. Um, but I always thought there there is a possibility, a potential for me to showcase my Korean speaking ability and try to link two cultures together. And that's kind of what I try to do in esports in a lot of ways too. I used to translate fan signs, for example, and let people know like what the memes are and what, what's going on. Um, but I, I just got big on social media because I, I kept trying to see what would land um, to, to get the attention of, of Korean fans. And it was ultimately me bringing a bunch of... Um, I'm getting someone to bring me a bunch of uh, instant noodles to China um, and taking a picture with them on on the bed because you know it's a it's somewhat of a popular I wouldn't say popular but it, it's it's like a a known thing that Koreans travel with a lot of instant yes. food with them because some of them even bring the kimchi oh, no, ironically they bring the fucking jar of kimchi with I've seen them in the hotel room yeah, yeah for real yeah. <laughs> and like instant ramen is is one of the most popular things to bring sure. if you're traveling in Korea because people usually bring like just a few because if it's an emergency situation some night where you can't find food you like, or yes. you're feeling a little sick. You can just use the kettle in the hotel room Perfect. and make some instant ramen. Um, but I brought like I don't know how many, like twenty packs of okay. ramen, maybe even more, right. and just like put a, put a photo on the bed and, and and posted a big meme, and it got popular. And then I got contacted by a bunch of people instantly, like, oh, it seems like you can speak Korean really well. Like, I want to hear about your lines. Nice. Like, news stations were picking up and stuff. That's how I started getting popular. And then people found out that I loved this one particular food, bude chige. So I. I got popular for that, did a bunch of review videos, made a YouTube channel. 
Um, and most of the, the memes and posts I did were, were all in Korean, but they were written, right? They weren't videos. So um, and all of those were looked over by my friends, my my girlfriend at the time, wife, you know, making sure, like, I didn't make any mistakes or errors. And, like, sometimes I would write a meme out and someone would be like, well, that's grammatically incorrect, but this is really funny. Like, let's work on this together. But it looked, my Korean was, like, perfect in those. And I was worried that when I made video content, people were going to be like, oh, his Korean's not as good as I thought. But it was, like, actually the opposite. People were like, oh, wow, it, it is really him. I had my, th- right. my doubts, but I guess he does speak Korean, right? Um, and then that led to a, a partnership opportunity with a few different Budechige restaurants um, to put my face on on some of these these uh, Budechige flavors. And then I also tested them and, and helped build them with the company. And then I got my, my own Budechige that I sold. Um, it's not being sold right now because we're working on a new recipe, but... It's on Hades, and then I made the pizza, the frozen pizza, because I was like, "Well, let's bring my American culture into this food right. business a little bit." And it's called my food line is called the American Pizza. You can actually like see it. I'm going the wrong way here. You can see like two boxes I have back there. I mean, not very clearly, but anyways, um, I have two different flavors. One is pepperoni. The other one's bacon cheddar. These are two kind of things that you can find in America. I'd say pepperoni, obviously, way more more classic than something like bacon cheddar, but. I wanted to show Koreans this is what frozen pizza tastes like in the States. Um, whereas, as you mentioned, like it's very different what you, what you eat here. And uh, the reception has been really good. A lot of foreigners who live in Korea order it because they're like, oh, I can finally get a frozen right. pizza that I like out here. So I, I wanted to try to do something outside of esports and do something fun because I love Korea. And I, I wanted um, people to know that like culturally I'm very attached to Korea. Like I, I understand a lot of Korean culture, I feel like I've, I think about some things like a Korean more than an American. And yes, I, it would start, started, I was kind of a meme, but I was lucky enough to, to get opportunities to make some, some business happen. And I want to bring good food to people. So if you're ever in Korea, check it out. <laughs> you can't buy his stuff overseas. And people always ask me, can I send that Gosh. overseas? Not, not yet. Maybe one day. Right. You alluded to it earlier, but I, did, I actually wasn't aware you had done a, an event of Valorant because that was what I was going to ask you is because if people don't know, Valorant has a setup somewhat akin to League of Legends where like the whole world does play the game, but it's regionalized and then you go in the national terms. I feel like League fans should understand this. So there is obviously like, look, it's not just Korea in this case, it's actually Pacific region because it's also like China and people from like Singapore and stuff like that, right? In VCT, the essentially the equivalent of like what the Riot circuit is in League if people are not from Valorant, basically if you look at the people who cast this league it's like Achilles, your old mate tasteless believe it or not if people don't know Chobra everyone will know him from back in the day I, I, to me it seems like an obvious shoe and like why not try your hand there like were you actually ever thinking of Valorant obviously it has, yeah. like, I would say as crossover with sort of Overwatch I feel like you could be good at that game too is there a reason you haven't sort of gone into that game more are you more just league only well, now what's going on I have I wanted to focus a little bit more on league um since I'm new to it, right? But I have had talks with them and we haven't been able to work out a an agreement that makes sense for both of us just yet in terms of how much my involvement would be because of my League of Legends schedule. But I am very interested in casting Valorant. I would be shocked if I don't cast it at some point um, just because I end up casting everything and I have a background in, in FPS and like my friends are all commentating it, my colleagues... And I watch VCT like pretty regularly. I, I enjoy it. Um, Valorant's a really fun game. It, uh, you know, it's very similar yet different to Counter Strike. And I think the graphic style a lot of puts a lot of people off. But for me, like I actually prefer it to Counter Strike just because it feels more familiar because it's closer to Overwatch. You know, sure. um, and uh, I don't know. I, I I really like Valorant. I think it has a, a really budding scene and i think there is an opportunity for it to grow and explode it's not huge in korea it's another one of those games like right. the ones we've talked about before that have really good korean players but not that popular in korea as an esport korean player base is actually quite high for valorant as well from what i'm told not just the like the pc bung numbers are okay but the player base is, is from what i'm told actually quite high but uh the esports viewership is not so you know that that might change but obviously overseas viewership for it is very good uh, for vct I would love to cast it. I really enjoyed casting the first strike tournament was the tournament I commentated, which is basically kind of like a preseason type um, tournament, like before East. It was like the first really real took... sort of like official tournament, wasn't it? Right, right. So that was fun. I thought, you know, I did okay, but nobody was really casting it yet at that time. So what sure. do I compare myself to? But yeah, I, I, I see a, a future where 
I cast that game, you know, it doesn't mean I want to quit League. I just think it'd probably be something else that I'd, I'd work on at some point once it once it makes sense. Do you think, being as obviously, as people will know if they listen to the rest of the interview, it's not like you always chose to leave games. Sometimes the circumstances change or the game died or the jobs just weren't there. If League of Legends, because it does look like it's like one of those games like a Counter-Strike now, where if you don't fuck up the sort of game engine and the updates, it'll, it seems to me like it could always hold a space as one of the big esports games. And so we're actually sort of in the dream scenario of, sort, like I said at the beginning of the interview, maybe you can just stay in one game now. Maybe you don't have to move around. Do you see a world where if League kept going, Wolf could be here in 10 years in League? Yeah, I, I definitely could see that. Um, I think esports is is always changing. And, you know, there have been many times in my career where I'm like, I got to get out of this in like two years or or it's doomed. Like, I, I got to find right. something else. I told myself that many times. Like, oh, I got I to gotta get out. Um, or, you know, I'm not going to have a future. You know, esports isn't a good career. And everybody knows caster rates have always been up and down and it's really dependent on the economy and, and and the game's health and stuff like that it's not always really in your control necessarily whether you're the their best commentator or not sometimes it's, there's just there's a finite amount of money that that you can gain based on like the esports economy and you know people talk about esports winter a lot and like the esports winter stresses out every commentator everybody's nervous right but league does seem like it's one of the games that's in the best position and I think I would like to. I, I would love to say that I could do it in ten years. Would I predict that right now? That in in you know, what twenty thirty four, I'm still casting. I wouldn't predict that, but I I hope I am. I hope I can cast league forever. Like the goal, the dream is to be a commentator forever. Because as much as doing something else could be safer, it's not what I want. And I've tried to to get out before and do something safer, or at least I told myself that. But what did I do? I I went to another game and started afresh and continue to be an esports commentator it's what i love it's what i enjoy and if i do something else you know maybe it'll be more financially stable but it definitely won't be i won't love it as much as doing this so i hope we do have like a forever game here in in, in league of legends and in the lck at the end of this interview do you have a final message is there anyone you want to thank or say hello to um I just want to thank everyone who supported me for the the last, you know, over a decade of my life, almost a decade and a half. We're getting closer to here in esports. I know I've left a lot of games. I've I've walked away from a lot of games. Some games have walked away from me, weirdly enough, and I didn't say bye to them, like I said earlier. But thank you guys for always being there for me, whether you are a new fan of me or if you or if you've been following me since the very beginning, back in the GSL days. I always appreciate the kind messages you guys send me. And I hope that to those who aren't ready to love me yet, I hope that I can win you over by working hard because that's all I do. And that's that's what I want because the fans deserve the best. Thanks, Lauren, for this interview. I've had to make a lot of tough choices in my career, but thanks to the support of my Patreon community, the Skrilluminati, I never have to make tough financial decisions. So this video and all the rest on my channel are kindly supported by Ahmed Haju, Frisky, Mac Pugnaccio Rakula, Animosity, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gorney, Tosh, Toucan, and you know it if you've ever heard before, and you'll hear it many times in the future. A special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerry Keys Minion. Do you want to ask a question in my video AMA? Do you want to be part of one of those long discussions where we talk about whatever you like in esports? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are going to be. Or maybe you want to suggest a topic for a future Thorin's Thoughts type video. Well, if any of these perks or others appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is today and join the Skrilluminati by joining the Patreon link in the description box below.